I like this cartoon. It was from the Rolling Stone. And uh, it shows Velikovsky as introducing a touch of the Wild West into uh, celestial dynamics. And that was really my, uh, the magnet that drew me to Velikovsky. Velikovsky's astrophysics started in his best-selling Worlds in Collision, where he threw down a gauntlet to astronomers, which in earlier centuries, as uh, my friend Dr. Irving Wolfe said, would have had him burned at the stake. His proposal of recent chaos in the planetary system exposed our worst fear, doomsday, the end of the Earth, the end of us. Astronomers who would have happily thrown fuel on the flames boasted that they hadn't read his book because it disobeyed Newton's law of gravity. This was religious dogmatism, not science. However, many scholars did take Velikovsky seriously, I'm pleased to say, and some of those who took him most seriously are at this conference. So this is a kind of a trip down memory lane where I trace my path to where I am now, which may help some of you understand some of the weird stuff that I come out with. I was born in, during the Second World War, and my father uh, ended up an invalid, I'm afraid, and so he was in and out of a military hospital. Now, while I was in high school, in the, sort of midway through, he came home from one of his visits to hospital with a book in his hand and he said, I think you might be interested in this. It was that red book there, Worlds in Collision. Well, as a, in primary school, I'd been interested in astronomy to the point where I would memorise facts out of the encyclopaedia, draw pictures and go to school and do a show and tell until the kids uh, in my class decided they'd had enough of me. And, uh, and told me in no uncertain terms. But the thing that impressed me with this book was I'd never seen the scientific method applied so broadly. He made leaps from one uh, topic, one uh, discipline to another that I had never seen before. And as it says here, his work crossed over and stimulated new directions of thought in a vast number of academic fields which alone is no mean feat. But he also showed us, as the Washington Evening Star put it, to not be afraid to stake out new intellectual territory in defiance of fashionable thought. This is from Henry Zecker. He challenged the mysteries of the universe. He sought answers to our most perplexing questions discovered many and inspired inquisitive minds to search for more. That alone will mark him as one of the most profoundly influential scholars of the century, perhaps of all time. Now, I read this book, as I said, at high school, and I tried to interest friends there and other students, and I was surprised at how disinterested they seemed to be. So, and also I had this difficulty, how can all of these teachers and people that I've looked up to and all of these encyclopedias I've read be wrong? So wrong. So I kind of let it drift for a few years and then just before going to university, I read the book again and I decided, right, the university is the place to ask questions and get answers. Well, my university education uh, disabused me of that idea because what I found was either the answer I got back was not related to the question I asked or else I got actual hostility. And that surprised me. It finally meant that I got out of academia. I began postgraduate research, upper atmosphere research, but found that I was being sort of used as slave labour and uh, decided to leave halfway through the first postgrad year and joined IBM. In those years it was the wild west of computing really and I got to learn everything because I never liked being presented with a black box. I had to know how it worked. That was part of my 
uh, psyche, I think. And so with IBM, I learnt the hardware, the software, the operating system, the compilers, and so on, which eventually led me to being used as the systems engineer for the National University, which, when I look back, was an incredible piece of luck because this was at the time of the moon landings. And I had access to the professors, the libraries, everything. In those days, they didn't have combination locks and electronic locks on everything, so I could walk freely and ask questions and it actually had some friends amongst the academic staff. So that's a, a bit of that background. But after that book was published, of course, there was a, a funeral and I bought every book that came out. I was impatient to get Velikovsky's next book. And then some of the warriors came to the fore after the AAAS ambush and wrote books, which I also got. C.J. Ransom, who spoke yesterday, uh, His Age of Velikovsky, which was published in 1976, and also Alfred de Grazia, compiled a book, The Velikovsky Affair, which is well worth reading. And that was published in 1966. Now, one of the tests of a good hypothesis, because it's not a, a theory until it's been tested experimentally or observationally, is the more outrageous yet correct a prediction is, the more weight it should carry in favour of that hypothesis. And Velikovsky predicted that Venus had been incandescent only a few thousand years ago. He said, Venus is hot. And this is a small excerpt from a 1964 interview with Eric Larrabee, who was largely responsible, as Dr. Wolf said, for the uh, publication of the world's in collision, in the face of a lot of opposition. Now you understand well that I had no personal means to send a marine probe. <laughs> if I may be a, a devil's advocate just momentarily, I know what many of, of your critics have said is that uh, a prediction like this is a matter of chance and that they imply that you were pulling things out of the air. Well, obviously, you could have said a great many other things about Venus. You could have said Venus has two moons or is made out of cottage cheese or something other than saying that it is hot. Uh, what, what led you in particular to say, quite contrary to, to the belief of the time, that Venus was a hot planet? Well, first I will see what I said. At the end of my book, in the very last two sections, before the section, the end, I put two claims. So the position which I selected for them in my book by itself proves the importance I gave to them. These were, first, Venus must be very hot. Must be hot. Must be very hot, is very hot. I called the chapter Thermal Balance of Venus. And I said, Venus gives off heat not as usually supposed to be a planet gets so much heat from the sun and reflects so much heat in the space. It gives its own heat. Of course, if it is a body like other bodies in the solar system of six billion years or longer, older, of course, then you wouldn't expect that it would give still uh, give off heat. heat. Now I said also that that it was observed by contemporaries of those events and the after as a, an incandescent body. At the same time, still in 1959, it was calculated and accepted that the surface temperature of Venus is 17 degrees Celsius, only about 3 degrees above the temperature of the Earth. It's very similar to ours. To Earth. In 1961, it was found that by radio signals arriving from Venus that it is very hot, actually 600 Fahrenheit. 
And your, your reason for believing this was that your theory required that it be a new planet, a young planet, in uh, geological astronomical time. Yes, it was and the cause of the needle heat, but also uh, the result of the short but very stormy history of this body. But and let me also say that 600 degrees of 1959 was one of the reasons to send the marina probe to find that it is not so. I heard mm, a man, a scientist from uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, who, speaking before the AAA convention in Philadelphia, made another, expressed his hope that it will be found the temperature much lower. What was found, it was still higher, not 600, but 800 degrees. Hmm. Now there is an outrageous yet correct prediction. That alone should have uh, galvanized really curious scientists to investigate his work further. Dr. Irving Wolf talked about what happened in 1974 at the AAAS San Francisco meeting. In, in that meeting, the, which was organized as a symposium, Velikovsky's Challenge to Science, it was organized by Professors Donald Goldsmith, Owen Gingrich, Ivan King, and attended by Emmanuel Velikovsky and Professors Donald W. Goldsmith, Norman W. Storer, Carl Sagan, J. Daryl Mulholland, and Peter Huber. Fred Jernerman, who was uh, one of the inner circle, described it as an ill-planned didactic ambush that failed to discredit Velikovsky and actually had an unexpected backlash on his detractors. That was written in an article called A Kick in the Ass." <laughs> and David Stove, who's an Australian philosopher and also uh, one of the people who doesn't conform, said, we all grizzle about specialization, professionalization, departmental empire building, etc. But unless and until you read the details of this case, you can have no idea of the pitiless ferocity or the organizational muscle that organized science can display. That was in an article called The Velikovsky Story, The Scientific Mafia. That other book that's on there, there's this two, The Scientists Confront Velikovsky, and the other one is Carl Sagan and Emmanuel Velikovsky, which is quite a detailed uh, piece of work by Charles Ginnenthal, who was one of Velikovsky's warriors. Now, Carl Sagan uh, did say something about Velikovsky on the program Cosmos. And uh, let me have a look here. It shows a, a double standard, I think, and also the fact that science is only trivially self-correcting today, or other words, during normal or settled science. You can see that the herd in instinct in science is very strong, and this has only been made worse by the global internet type of groupthink amongst them. And the double standard in evidence and scrutiny, one side has chosen evidence is another's anathema. Extraordinary claims require only ordinary evidence. Settled science requires a bomb under it to move it. Experts, in my opinion, are the last to know when a fundamental change arrives. The electric universe, for example. But when you look back, all big changes, even the uh, idea of sending rockets to the moon was said to be impossible by experts. Heavier than air flight was to be impossible. So the last thing you do is ask a grey-haired expert what the future holds, because they will be the last to know. So I, I show you this now just to get an impression. I think Sagan at this point felt some guilt for what he'd done. 
There are many hypotheses in science which are wrong. That's perfectly all right. It's the aperture to finding out what's right. Science is a self-correcting process. To be accepted, new ideas must survive the most rigorous standards of evidence and scrutiny. The worst aspect of the Velikovsky affair is not that uh, many of his ideas were wrong or silly or in gross contradiction to the facts. Rather, the worst aspect is that some scientists attempted to suppress Velikovsky's ideas. The suppression of uncomfortable ideas may be common in uh, religion or in politics, but it is not the path to knowledge, and there's no place for it in the endeavor of science. We do not know beforehand where fundamental insights will arise from about our mysterious and lovely solar system. And the history of our study of the solar system shows clearly that accepted and conventional ideas are often wrong, and that fundamental insights can arise from the most unexpected sources. Yet, as I said, Sagan is disingenuous and should have taken his own advice. He was a key suppressor at the 1974 AAAS meeting. Here's an example of what I mean about experts being the last to know when a paradigm shift has begun. In the Scientific American, it says, we are all impoverished by the selective rejectionism of modern science all of the taboos in science. In this excerpt, Velikovsky is troubled by the way Ponce reports the San Francisco meeting. And this was shown at the Portland, uh, sorry, the uh, meeting in, at McMaster University in 1974. I had some information secondhand from Earl Milton who had some inside uh, information. He said, Velikovsky was assured by the editors of Ponce that Ralph Jurgens would oversee the final report. Usually Velikovsky lectures without notes. At the San Francisco meeting he sat to read his paper because he was fearful of omitting important points. He was asked from the floor if any of his predictions had been disproved. He answers he knows of none. Velikovsky is angered that Ponce did not print his response to Sagan's challenge to name which organic, organic compound has a refractive index of 1.44 and has infrared absorption features at 3.4 micrometers and 11.2 micrometers. At the meeting, Velikovsky did answer both questions at length. These are important uh, scientific, bits of scientific evidence. Now this film, uh, shot there in June 1974 at the McMaster meeting is something that I did on a brand new Kodak 400 foot cartridge sound camera. It was something that Kodak had finally done that was to introduce sound Super 8 cameras. I had taken my own, I'd built my own radio microphone uh, but it, unfortunately it suffered a lot of interference at various times during the, the meeting and this is the only one that has uh, good sound, so this has never been seen before. Why should we uh, create a gap of ourselves? Pensee will repent them to um, those, of course, who have no admit to answer publication are welcome to Pensee. I hope that Pensee will return to its beginning and be again a strong organ, small in the beginning, but reaching, as we know, the end of the world and was probably instrument in bringing you today here. And thank you once more. And I will probably say a few words for those. Continue what I could not say here um, at the banquet this evening. Once more, thank you.
So that was my first meeting with Velikovsky, and you saw the reference to me by coming from the ends of the world. <laughs> and I have here some photographs taken at that meeting. On the left is Velikovsky standing to answer a question from uh, in the audience. Uh, he, his daughter wrote to me and asked for a copy of that photo, and uh, I sent it to him and received a, uh, a thank you from him. You can see some of the crowd there. I can just pick out my wife up the back there somewhere. And, but there are a lot of the, uh, uh, the warriors visible in some of these photographs. And on the right is Steve Talbot. Now, it's interesting that my connection with the Talbots started with Steve because I had written to him once I knew that this conference was on uh, and stating what I had done and my interest and so on. And uh, he invited me to uh, sit on one of the panels. So I got to uh, meet people there. And it was the, there, of course, that I also uh, met Bill Mullen and was very impressed by his opening address. Another shot of the McMaster meeting. There's uh, one of our Scottish scholars sitting in the middle there. Uh, he did a lot of work with the Society for Interdisciplinary Studies, which was the UK uh, arm of the Velikovskian movement, if you like to put it that way. There's a, many people I can pick out of that, but uh, it gives you some idea of the crowd. Also speaking at that meeting, uh, and somebody who also had inspired me. I put him uh, as a lieutenant of Velikovsky, really, on the scientific side, Ralph Jurgens. I've tried everything I can think of to get more photos of Ralph, but that one was taken at the Grand Canyon. And uh, I've been in touch with uh, a good friend of his was Dr. Earl Milton, a physicist from Lethbridge, Alberta. And uh, I've been in touch with Earl Milton's son, and he's looked through all of the material that he has of his father's, but I've not been able to get another photograph of him, which is a great pity. Earl Milton wrote about him. Uh, in 1973 and 1974, Jurgens did yeoman service in preparing Velikovsky for San Francisco while serving as Ponce's physical science gatekeeper. Jurgens served as Velikovsky's research advisor providing invaluable interpretation which avoided many pitfalls within the sea of commentaries now being made about the state of planet Venus. Ralph also coached the manual about how to present himself when he faces his opponents at San Francisco. This is one of the uh, inspirational things that I got from Ralph Jurgens. If the sun and the stars indeed succeed in fusing lighter elements to form heavier ones, are the relevant activities carried out more or less in plain sight in their atmospheres? Having asked this question, though, Jurgens nevertheless went on to estimate the electrical energy and voltages uh, based on no input from the nuclear process. In other words, if there is nuclear processes going on in the photosphere, he merely calculated the electrical energy in required to provide the radiant energy output. Of course, to say this flies in the face of particle physics because the conditions in that 5,000 degree or so photosphere is not sufficient, of course, to even begin to talk about nuclear fusion, according to standard thinking. He says here, and this was a key to his model and one which is now being tested by Sapphire, the electric sun hypothesis assigns the solar body the role of an anode, that of the higher potential electrode in a cosmical electric discharge. That's the simplicity of the model. And also the, the genius of Ralph was to identify the fact that all of the detailed features that we actually observe are to be seen in an anode discharge.
And uh, of course the most confronting thing he said was the modern astrophysical concept that ascribes the sun's energy to thermonuclear reactions deep inside in the solar interior is contradicted by nearly every observable aspect of the sun. That should have been a, a huge warning bell in the halls of academe, but as they say, uh, when you're woken by a loud noise, uh, you get very annoyed. It was in a few years later, in 1979, I was working for the Australian government briefly in Washington, D.C. And while there, I took the opportunity, my family was with me, uh, I rang Velikovsky at his home and mentioned our meeting in 1974 and I asked whether it would be possible to uh, visit and talk to him about the work that I was interested in. Uh, he and his wife graciously had us there on the 29th of April, 1979. And uh, it was there that he in answer to my question, what is it we don't understand about gravity, he gave me this small pamphlet, Cosmos Without Gravitation. It was a synopsis of a more comprehensive document written from 1941 to 1943. So here I'll give you some of the chapter headings to give you the flavour of what's inside. First of all, and this is fundamental, gravitation is an electromagnetic phenomenon. So now you can see where I got it from. This is where it all started. He gave a list of phenomena not in accord with the theory of gravitation. He looked at the attraction between two atoms, and this is something that had occurred to chemists. The molecular attraction between atoms can sometimes be down to dipole forces the fact that the atoms are distorted in a molecule gives them one side of the molecule a slightly more uh, positively charged than the other. And this, of course, is a feature of Jerry Pollack's work where the water molecule is distorted so that one side is more positive than the other. You have a positive and a negative dipole. He covers the attraction of bodies toward the Earth, the time of ascent and descent of a pendulum because he thought they should be different and the effect of charge on the weight of a body. If I get a chance, I'll talk about why that uh, idea really doesn't work, but uh, that took a long while to figure out. And of course, his statement that attraction, repulsion, you'll notice, he's talking about repulsion between bodies as well, because a dipole can repel as well as attract. And electromagnetic circumduction act in the solar system. That was his claim. He also covered the anomaly of mercury and other phenomena where he tries to explain them. These are some of the phenomena not in accord with the theory of gravitation according to Velikovsky. Water is 800 times heavier than air but millions of tons of water droplets are held miles above the ground in clouds. And Jerry Pollack I think has uh, shown the way to understand that. Mountains don't exert the pull expected by gravity. That massive rock should attract a, a plumb bob slightly towards it. It doesn't. So that gave rise to the theory of isostasy, where you have to have a mountain underneath the Earth to kind of balance out the forces so the pendulum actually points <laughs> towards the centre of the Earth. This is the kind of extremes you have to go to when your theory doesn't really work. Gravity is stronger over oceans than land. The spinning gaseous sun should be oblate. It's almost a perfect sphere. Gravity can't restore orbital perturbations. There is nothing to restore a slight uh, departure from your orbit caused by another body so that over time the whole thing becomes chaotic. In fact, it has been calculated, I think, by the orbital dynamicists that the solar system should not remain stable for more than a few million years. Beyond that time, it should be destroyed by chaotic behaviour. The sweep of a comet's tail around the sun, that's not a gravitation, it's not explained by our gravitational effects. And Laplace, 
he notes, calculated the speed of gravity must be in excess of 50 million times the speed of light. So these are all the keys that I had given to me by Velikovsky. In particular, this, his idea, this is his idea here, each atom is made up of positive and negative electricity and though neutral as a whole, and these are his words, may form an electric dipole when subject to an external electric force. Attraction is not due to inherent gravitational properties of matter, I wouldn't say mass, but instead to the well-known electrical properties of attraction. Two dipoles arrange themselves like uh, uh, bar magnets on a slippery surface. If you just throw them on the surface, they'll try and attach north-south, north-south and daisy chain. And they, are, they will always swing to try and attract one another. <clears throat> However, if grab, and this is the arguments against that simple model, and Velikovsky gave me that document on the basis that it was a preliminary thinking. It, it, it certainly had a lot of questions left. If gravity were that simple, an electric field across a polarizable dielectric, that is like in a capacitor, should modify gravity markedly because there you are, you're distorting the atoms in an electric field. But it doesn't. It does slightly in the Byfield-Brown effect where uh, you, a capacitor tends to move in the direction of one of the charged plates. But that doesn't explain gravity. And it should be shielded by a metal conductor because this is, we're dealing with a bulk uh, electrical field. It isn't. Also, the atomic dipole force is too strong. It's the force that holds molecules together, one of the forces. And if we were held to the Earth like a molecule, we'd be, you know, maybe a few centimetres thick on the surface. <laughs> so having been given in 1979 the keys, I had what they call the prepared mind. I was on the lookout for a classical physics approach, the kind of approach that got us to the beginning of the 20th century and has given us all of the technology we see now. Very little of the 20th uh, century beyond about the 1920s has contributed much at all to modern technology. It came in a tiny advertisement in the Scientific American in December 1981 and it advertised the Journal of Classical Physics and the first issue by Ralph Sansbury, who was the uh, originator of this journal, uh, was called Electron Structure. Now, Velikovsky had shown that it was the structure of matter which may give rise to the electric force. And if the electron has structure, that's important. So this was one of the keys. He, what he did was to repeat the atomic orbital model of smaller charged particles inside the electron and proton. So imagine them as tiny atoms. It's a repeated pattern, a kind of fractal approach to looking at science. And by assuming the electrons have this simple structure, Ralph explained magnetism. He was able to derive Ampere's law just by, based on this simple model. Most importantly, this model requires for an electron to remain stable that the electric force operates between all of the bits that make up that electron instantly. If there's any delay, then the particles don't know where each other are and the th whole thing flies apart. In fact, he calculated that the particles, if they were free to move outside the electron, would travel from here to the far side of the Andromeda galaxy in one second. Now, this gives you an idea of the speed of the electric force. And that gives you the idea of the speed of gravity. It also simplified things. Here we have the electric force explains magnetism and gravity. And classical physics was all about simplification, not inventing more and more forces and particles to get a Nobel Prize. It was to try and find out the real nature of 
matter. And the thing about, uh, or one of the principles I've worked on ever since getting all of these ideas is that the simpler the model, the more likely it is to be correct. And also this model provides a real basis for quantum behavior. Cause and effect are reinstated. Quantum theory got rid of cause and effect. Einstein got rid of any means of measuring things because he removed any standards between them, he, the, the two of them, they got rid of physics. I'll just, uh, oh, and it also discards the wave particle duality of light. Ralph did some experiments at great cost to himself, which uh, didn't prove his view of it, but I think it, um, yeah, it helped me to understand light as a wave motion only. I don't think I'll mess around with this. Einstein's equivalence where you know, gravitational mass and inertial mass are said to be equivalent. They're not. Uh, in fact, uh, even the picture there shows that um, the guy standing on the Earth is being attracted to all the atoms in the Earth, which means he's being attracted out to the horizon and the other, from the other side of the Earth. It's nothing like being pushed in a, up in a lift or in a rocket. The equivalence in that diagram is not there. Velikovsky uh, said that the equality of inertial and gravitational mass is a remarkable accidental coincidence in Newton's system. And he's right. It's impossible to adopt Einstein's equivalence principle of inertia and gravity because an outside observer cannot observe, perceive the Earth with all the lifts traveling in different directions. Once again, you've lost your, your measurement standard of your place in the universe through Einstein's work. Everything is relative. It suggests the equivalence is the same because subatomic electric dipoles are responsible for both the attractive force of gravity and the repulsive force of inertia. It's exactly the same pr uh, process, so you, you can expect them to be equivalent once you understand it. Velikovsky said, it is probable that besides carrying a charge, the ground turns all of its atoms as dipoles towards the ionosphere. And that's what I've been showing in the last uh, few years in my presentations. Like this. And the result is that you have the positive heavy nuclei drawn towards the center of mass and the other pole, the negative poles, facing outwards. And this changes our view of celestial dynamics immediately. But this is, Velikovsky didn't take this step. In fact, it took me decades to take this step because it raises all sorts of other issues. I'm pleased to say that, I mean, this infers that the insides of celestial bodies are hollow because you've got a repulsive force pushing outwards and a repulsive force from the rest of the matter in the universe pushing inwards, and the most stable form in that case is a thick spherical shell, which means that we know nothing about what's inside the Earth or the Sun or any other body or the Moon. Uh, I was on, well, let's say, at various times in my uh, journey in the electric universe, I've come to a point where I've said, oh my God, how am I ever going to tell anyone about this? Because, you know, it, it's really confronting. I mean, it's like going from the flat earth to a, a spherical earth. And uh, it takes time to get over that until I find enough evidence that I feel uh, I can actually give a story which is convincing. And I knew that I had to look for seismic evidence to show that it's a shell and not a, uh, a solid sphere or even a solid and liquid sphere. Part of the evidence came from the Apollo uh, moon landings, the first ones where they crashed the, uh, one of the, the lunar module back into the moon, having placed a seismometer on the moon. So this was the first seismic experiment on any other body than the Earth. And what was the result? The moon rang like a bell for almost an hour. Well, that one set the geologists back on their heels because the most obvious answer is that the moon is hollow. 
But of course they couldn't accept that, so they've made up a really complicated story to try and uh, get around it. But then I came across, somebody sent me a link to uh, work by a South African. He was also in IT, as I had been for all of my career. And he'd come to, to look at uh, deep earthquakes because he was interested in this, the old stories of uh, hollow earth and theories, because they go back hundreds of years. And he found that the best answer to the seismic evidence was that the earth is a shell, a hollow shell. And when I looked at his evidence, he'd done a very good job of analyzing it, and uh, I realized here we have sufficient evidence to really investigate further. You'll notice too that the outside of every celestial body will have a negative pole facing outwards. It's like having the same pole of a magnet in the shape of a sphere. And if you have two of those bodies, you try and push them together, you'll know what it's like trying to push the like poles of a magnet, uh, magnets together. So all stars and planets in the universe repel each other with an inverse square law. This answered a question that troubled Halton up because his research which I think is outstanding, showed that the universe is balanced. It's not collapsing, it's not expanding, it seems to be just hanging there. And you can't do that if gravity's pulling everything together. So this answered that question too. Gravity on the cosmic scale is repulsive. Newton's attractive force has a very limited sphere of influence. There is an internal gravitational <coughs> field that is repulsive and the interiors of all celestial bodies are not what we think. The solar system, Velikovsky said attraction, repulsion and electromagnetic circumduction act in the solar system. But of course Velikovsky was unaware that the plasma shields electric fields. So it's much more complex than that. There was no mention either of how you establish feedback to have settled the solar system down from a chaotic state <coughs> just a, a few thousand years ago to the present uh, clockwork uh, order. The sun, <coughs> pardon me, planets and satellites, comets are all charged bodies and are inter interdependent. This is Velikovsky once again. The sun is charged negatively with respect to the earth. Now this statement is incorrect because of Jurgen's later work. The sun is a magnet. The form of the corona suggests a strong magnetic field. Well, Velikovsky was the first one to talk about magnetism on other bodies, uh, really in it, uh, with any uh, coherent hypothesis to back it. But he said the sun's charge and rotation must produce a strong magnetic field because a rotating charged body must produce a dipole magnetic field. That's been dismissed because when they calculate how much charge you need, they say, oh, it's impossible. But they're using plain electrostatics. Forget plasma. <clears throat> the charged planets move as charged bodies at right angles to the sun's magnetic field. That's what he thought. In other words, it was more like an electric motor than... Um, uh, and this is the point. <coughs> Pardon me. Gravity exists. And gravity is a special form of the electric force, almost identical to magnetism. It's just that those two forces are created under different circumstances, one at the free subatomic level and the other one trapped in an atom. Uh, <clears throat> but they're identical to that extent. Now, the big journey came when uh, the Saturn story came up because uh, I read Dave Talbot's book, published in 1980, as soon as it came out, and Dwight Cardona had been an inspiration to me ever since the uh, Kronos and Ponce articles began to be published. And it was in the fall of 1977 in Kronos 3, number one, Dwaidu published The Son of Night, which referred to Saturn, which caught my attention, of course. And uh, <clears throat> Dwaidu's research was sufficiently well documented and thought through that I used his 
findings as a basis for trying to understand the history of the solar system, the recent history, because I wanted to know, you know, where did Venus come from? Where did the Earth come from? Where did Mars come from? What had happened? And could it be explained in, uh, in proper classical physics? So he and I corresponded quite a lot, and he published many of my articles in uh, Kronos. Uh, so the two of us, this is where myth can become science, instead of as we have now, science becoming myth. And the resulting cosmological picture that emerged had to be simple and coherent. But as it turns out, the story that unfolded would make 2001 A Space Odyssey look like child's play. I'd love to see this work in an IMAX theatre. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. L. Milton uh, was a good friend and visited us at the time of Halley's Comet appearance and stayed with us in uh, Canberra. I took this photo in 1983. I'd been posted by the government to London twice, which was very unusual. Um, in the 80s, and uh, I had Earl in invited to speak to the SIS group over there. It was with the SIS group that I began my first writing of articles and having them published. In 1980, he and Jurgens independently concluded that a comet nucleus would be scarred, and th this is a direct quote, <clears throat> like an electrode in an arc. Over time, the cometary nucleus should become cratered and pitted. When a spacecraft finally achieves a rendezvous with one of the comets, scientists are going to be surprised to find a surface pitted like that of the Moon, Mars, or Mercury. And that was written at the time uh, when scientists had never seen a comet surface. The first flyby took place six years later. In England, I caught up with Eric Crew, who was a disciple of Charles Bruce. And you'd be surprised, this is one of the things that con continues to surprise me, is that there seems to be no new ideas under the sun, because you find that people in the past have had the same ideas, but they've only gone so far and not put the whole picture together, which I see as my job, is putting the big picture together. Dr. Bruce's lightning research with the Electrical Research Association and the attendance at Sydney Chapman's 1941 Kelvin lecture on the sun led to the application of these ideas to cosmic phenomena and to a new all-electric universe. Charles Bruce wrote, the surfaces of stars can be explained as lightning discharges which are observed in the atmosphere of the Earth. In 1944, I was only a toddler then. Bruce wrote, in fact, it may well be that both Jupiter and Saturn were at one time minor stars and that their satellite systems were formed as the result of minor or planetary nova outbursts. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. Eric did a lot of work trying to uh, get Bruce acknowledged for his work. And I only missed him seeing him on one of my occasions in England, I realised before he died, which was uh, unfortunate. I've managed to mo meet most of the people I wanted to see because the job took me around the world very often. Now, in 1994, and this is 20 years after the uh, Portland meeting, uh, sorry, after the McMaster meeting, Dave Talbot put on an international conference called Velikovsky, Ancient Myth and Modern Science. And this is where I saw Dave's presentation. He missed mine. I was talking about Velikovsky and the evidence for it having been recent, recently born. And um, I said to him, I think we should join forces because our combined story is far more powerful than either one of us alone. I've still got a little to go here with a film that might be of interest, if, that's, if I've got time. Okay. Uh, Mel and Amy Aitchison were amongst the first people I met when I went back in 1996, December, and camped on Dave's office floor for a month, and then we put on a, a meeting in Portland in 1997. Mel and Amy introduced me to Halton Arp, and uh, that was an inspiration, another inspiration. 
And then in May 2000, Help Narp spoke at our conference along with Tony Pratt, whom you've heard a lot about, and it was a historic event. More important, I would say, than the Solvay conference all that, those decades earlier. Halton Arp's views on cosmology published in Seeing Red set the goalposts for electric universe cosmology. I'd done a lot of work on the sun and the solar system. This painted the, the bigger picture and the whole thing became a, a more coherent cosmology. This is uh, Tony Pratt and I. The quest to understand Velikovsky's electrified cosmos led to plasma cosmology, a subject ignored by astrophysicists despite its engineering heritage and successful predictions. It was a critical juncture when, Anthony, when Tony uh, joined us at the request of Dave Talbot for our conference in May 2000. Tony's research gave us the opportunity to verify the convergence of the mytho-historical record with high-energy electrical discharges in space plasma. And this is some film of the historic Portland meeting Gravity changed, but Angie, gravity changing won't it's conquer Angie, just, uh, the insurmountable problem you see in uh, angular it wouldn't momentum. Help it not. wouldn't, and in fact, uh, the angular momentum problem for the so severe that uh, maybe you could just uh, take a minute to I explain yeah, why you don't see loose. any way uh, that Long orbits Scott, can be circularized Dennis. quickly. In other words, I mentioned Michael this Armstrong. instance. Uh, uh, it was just a numerical simulation. Right, uh, they disturbed one of the gas giants and then uh, two of them Faithful exchanged bin. orbits and they circularized within a thousand years. Uh, this was and, and and so, 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 so when we do a simulation, this simulation this was the we aha moment. Things, we're stuck when we assign <coughs> one numerical <coughs> parameter all day because they are frozen in. So, we, I mean, we've got no, we, we've got no wiggle. No wiggle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, that's... Uh, just we see the RRR big objects, galaxies with ejections along the line, and we see older galaxies along the same line. The, the, the way around the uh, angular momentum problem is that if they come out this way without any component, they only go up and down, and they stay along that line. So that I think we have perfectly good empirical evidence for objects being formed along the line and staying along that line. The data creates patterns that have to be explained. I mean, this configuration, as it has been reconstructed up to this point, has some incredibly specific components and interactions between them. And it is, in fact, actually at that level of greater deal that the power of the model itself just begins to flower. And it becomes extremely compelling because it's so specific the relationships are so specific, and it's so ludicrous. How could it possibly be confirmed? But you know exactly what needs to be confirmed because it's defined by these relationships. You go and you look, and there it is. And it's a puzzle for the... I, I mean, we have gone through this a thousand times. Ev and I were having... We would on the phone, and we would have these incredible exper experiences. Just the things we look for, once we can identify what should be found, be I have one more little clip to show, and this was uh, at an SIS meeting in London where Tony and I were speaking. I was talking on the electric universe and the Saturn configuration, or how to explain the impossible. I was followed by Tony Pratt on the origins of icons from antiquity. It was very refreshing to uh, to uh, to listen to Wall's talk on on the electric universe, and, and uh, uh, I guess I, I played play a role, some somewhat of a role, in, in establishing what is called the uh, the plasma universe, which is about the same thing. Um, hey, very refreshing to see that as a field that I worked in for gosh two and a half uh, decades or so, and uh, right now I'm working in. Um, Something very closely related, but it is, uh, but it's different. It's petroglyphs. Okay, it, it, it's not galaxies. Uh, rotation magnetic fields in galaxies, which uh, which we produced, which is on our websites or in any number of uh, publications. But it's uh, carvings on rock by man in prehistory. Now, why why are these important? Uh, this is a picture that I took on the Navajo reservation. 
and uh, which is absolutely typical of uh, petroglyphs that one, one will find uh, around the world. Um, as I'm going to show, uh, petroglyphs uh, have a definite orientation. They also uh, change in morphology and shape depending on the latitude that they're found on Earth. And this is typically, uh, this is at uh, about uh, 36 degrees latitude north, so it's lower than the, uh, than the United Kingdom. But, uh, but perfectly typical uh, around the Earth and the duck-shaped heads appear everywhere as, as, as well as these other symbols that I'm going to go into about why. Um, my first introduction to uh, Petroglyphs was uh, by David Talbot. I, I went to a meeting of his by accident and uh, learned something about what they were, were doing. And then uh, he showed me some <coughs> pictures. And, uh, and I looked at the pictures and uh, I said, well, where did you get these pictures? Because I had never seen them outside of an unclassified environment. <laughs> and uh, um, there are rocks. There are rocks. Where are these rocks stored? What a vault. What am I going to do now? <laughs> uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Bill.